Tony had one. So who's watching X Factor at the moment? I am. Um, and Delight Be the Script gave me the out which said because of my daughter. But it's got nothing to do with her. I love it. It's a great program. Um, and there's a guy in there, Christopher Maloney. Um, if I'm just talking nonsense then for people who aren't watching it, well I'll try to make some sense. But you might have seen his first audition and he came on and he was petrified. He was shaking. He was doing all the things that you hope you will never do if you ever have to stand up and perform in front of people. And then he's, he, he, one of the judges, they, they, they spotted that the guy was not having a great time. They said, well, what's going on? And they asked him, you know, why are you nervous? What's happening? And he went on to explain how he downloaded the application form five years in a row and not done anything about it. And finally he was there. And the reason he'd done nothing about it is because all his mates said to him, don't bother. You won't get through, you're not as good as all the others. Just don't do it. Don't try. And then if you've watched a few of the episodes as, as they have um, progressed, he's great, if you like that kind of music. But he's doing a fantastic job. He's not going to be Ella, but he's doing a great job. So you can tell I'm really happy with it. Right. I've got the most votes going in two weeks. There you go, you see, we've got a bit of a controversy here. I don't want to go after that. <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be a lot of knowledge in the room about this, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, so maybe you will win. But, but, but why am I talking about this? Well, I'm talking about it because I, I sense that there's a lot of pressure on senior teams at the moment. Um, and, and the great thing to do when you're under pressure is do nothing. And that's not a critical remark, it's an observation about human behaviour. It's a whole lot easier to stay with the status quo. And, and, and I wonder if that's what was going on in, this, in, in Christopher's life. So, very quickly, Kingfisher, let's get the disappointment out of the way. We don't brew beer. We are a, a, an international home improvement retailer working in eight countries. Our sales are about 11 billion. We, we have about 80,000 colleagues. Um, you'll see in there as well I've, I've sort of hijacked recently the branding of another with NP net positive I'll put that in a second but those are the main points um, that just to give you a context of who we are we have a thousand stores across those eight locations so we operate a lot of property um, and what have we done with that? well in the last five years we're quite proud of what we've done with our energy intensity. We set out originally to reduce it by 10% and we found that we had reduced it by 21% in that period. So what do we do? Well, we decided that we'd more than double that next target for the next phase of our activity. And we've uh, just committed as part of that net positive plan to reduce our uh, intensity, our energy intensity across our portfolio of properties by 45%. Okay. How on earth are we going to do that? Well, um, the book, Built to Last, Successful Habits of uh, Visionary Companies, introduced the idea, has everyone heard of um, the BHAG, Big, Hairy, Audacious Goals, the suggestion that that's how visionary companies um, set out to conduct themselves. Now, it, hopefully there's more humility in, in what I'm saying than to say we're visionary. I'll leave you to judge on that. But we have to come up with this new plan, the net positive plan, which is, which is about saying that companies that are going to thrive in the future are those that are going to move on from focusing solely on their negative impacts. This agenda around reduction, do less, isn't one that's inspiring. And so our aspiration is to start to become a restorative business, to do more, to put back as well as take out. And that's what this vision is about. That's what the net positive factor is. So um, we don't end up in the moment where you're thinking that all you're going to get is sort of corporate uh, communications from me. I'll, I'll make it relevant to the topic, which is energy. You'll see that we've chosen four subject areas where we say that we are going to focus our energy our activity. And that's because those are the areas where we think we will have the biggest impact. And one of them is energy. 
And what are we saying about it? Well, we're saying we have a vision for the world, which is that homes can be zero carbon or net generators of energy. And our aspiration by 2020 is that all of our stores and all of our customers' homes have those characteristics. So they're either zero carbon or they generate more energy than they consume. And then breaking down further, we've set ourselves a 2020 target. 38 terawatt hours of saved energy. Gobbledy good, isn't it? Anyone know what 38 terawatt hours is? I, I, I didn't. I had to ask. It's the current energy consumption of Scotland. So it's a big number, because last time I was there, it's a cold place. So we've set ourselves quite a big, audacious goal there. And we also, there's that 45% reduction that I mentioned. So, if the idea is that you set yourself some big goals, perhaps just a few moments on the, on the how. How did we manage to get the business to commit to something like that? And, and I think at the moment, you don't actually have to argue too hard around that how or that why because I think if you get into a conversation with senior executives, senior management, they understand um, because they're feeling it themselves and in their own homes that energy is going to cost a whole lot more in the future than it did in the past. The other thing we did is that we made a bit of a business, we made a business case around net positive. So standout statistic for me in, in researching this is that Munich Re, the insurance company, have um, talked about extreme weather events. They've moved the debate on from is the climate change going on or not because we can all get up, caught up in the wrong conversation. But they are saying that in the last 30 years, the rate at which extreme weather events is, is occurring there's more than doubled from 400 to over 900 per annum. And our biggest insurance claims in our business these days are around subsidence and flooding. They're not around theft and fire damage. It's just one of those business case statistics that have enabled us to create the plan that possible. So enough of the, uh, uh, of the future. Um, just a couple of slides to follow on what has worked, what we found has engaged our senior team today. And, and as I do that, I should just say, one of the things that we're saying about net positive, because it is such a, a, a large goal and a large aspiration, is that we haven't got all the answers. We, we genuinely have some thoughts about how we will get there. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're engaging in a dialogue with people and we're asking for contribution and commitment and comment and, <coughs> and assistance on the way. But these are the things that, that have worked so far. Well, B&Q in that period saved itself £20 million. Pounds, and how did it do that? Well, my encouragement to everyone would be, you're the experts. You know this subject so much better than your senior executives. You know this subject like the back of your hand and you can convince them about the activities they need to undertake. It's about uh, getting the right resource in to help you spot where money can be saved, where carbon can be reduced, where efficiency um, can be found. And you'll see that um, you know, the likes of the Carbon Trust, they can produce this advice. You, know, it, it, you don't have to pay great sums for this advice. It's the sort of help that one can get. So the first thing I'd say is, you're the expert, guide people. Um, great little uh, picture, that. that's actually a rabbit in headlights. Felt like it needed a bit of explanation. But it's almost back to this, oh my goodness, freeze, no action, no activity, is easier than doing things. And I think that that's potentially what happens when you're faced with these really big subjects. So our experience was that if you break things down into manageable chunks, then they're a whole lot more digestible. Um, for example, having identified that our biggest footprint was around our electricity usage, we then set about an engagement and a dialogue with our stores about how they could reduce them. Then taking it to the next level, we found the easiest way to encourage them to reduce their electricity consumption was to make a competition around it. So we published league tables 
when you could see one store against another store, and there was a little bit of competition, am I better than X, or you know, why is Y able to do that, and I'm not able to do it? Um, and you know, naturally, people uh, got quite engaged by that. Equally, um, we found that, that that age-old excuse of being phoned up by someone remote, saying, why are you using so much electricity? And they said, well, it was a dark day in Skegness that day, you know. You, you, think, you then got the manager with the data, who said, well, in the neighbouring store, it was fine. They didn't have to have all their lights on. So you get into a really good dialogue with people. The next tip, that's a picture of uh, our chief executive in Cheshire, is to, in, in, in it, one of his favourite uh, methodologies, um, I say it's his favourite methodology, he puts big targets out there publicly and then the organisation has to meet them. And, and there's an element of that going on, which is a good thing, I really encourage it, but it, oh my goodness, he said that, well we better find a way of delivering. It's a good technique, it works. So get your senior executives to commit large and commit publicly would be the next lesson. Of course, um, just making big commitments and then not following those up with active, continuing dialogue is, is a bit of a trap, we found. Um, having started these league tables and encouraged people to turn the lights off, we found that some people were getting a little bit enthusiastic because, as I'll tell you in a minute, we linked store, store bonuses to energy consumption reduction. And, um, we did find that one or two people were, were not creating the most, uh, the most uh, enjoyable experience for customers. You know, if you go to a lighting fixture, trying to buy lights for your house and all the lights are off, <laughs> it's not an inspiring experience. So, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't create the wrong behaviour. Grassroots buy-in was the, was the next thing just to talk to everyone about. Um, and there's five points there. Simple solutions and talking to people. We, we've got a great example around waste fill, of uh, uh, waste, waste for land fill coming out of the back of our store. We used to just have a big skip in, in the back, and everyone surprised to find it to fill it up quite regularly. What we then did was we decided to break down the, the waste streams coming out of the store. And we now have 27 of them. And when you are required to segregate and put things into smaller bins, you actually have to do something active about it, think about it, you have to behave differently. The next step we found was that actually we're now selling about seven of those waste streets, metal, paper, cardboard, plastics. So they're making money, and it's a very different dialogue with people to the one that says there's a big, massive skip in your car park, please do it. Um, we appointed ambassadors, environment champions in every single store. There's always an enthusiast in the store, and I think the, the dialogue that we're trying to get everyone into around net positive and this it's a good thing to do, is moving the dialogue from perhaps the worthy and the critical of the past to the encouraging and the inspiring. So if you're able to say to store teams, there's a bonus attached to this if we are selling our waste in a certain way, that's a whole lot better than someone cutting at them because they've left a room and not turned the lights on. Very different dialogue. Um, I've talked to you about the uh, competition we introduced. But we've also, we've, we've done a bit of carrot and a bit of stick. We've made the wrong behaviour more difficult. So if you're applying for a capital expenditure approval within your organisation now, you have to demonstrate how you're going to reduce your operational and your embodied carbon before that's going to be approved. It's a sort of add-on that you have to do as well. Um, and then I've mentioned the, the, the intensifying the right behaviour, objectives and bonuses. No, no, no magic in this. It's not rocket science. I'm sure you've all um, been doing similar things. The next thing to say was start small. Um, look, look, the, when I pulled this slide in, I had uh, I envisaged a brick and then a massive wall, but we've got a massive brick. But start small, build things from bit by bit. So the first thing we did around electricity was we put intelligent lighting systems in. So, you know, if you can't get behaviour change, you can't get people to turn the lights off, why not turn them off for them? Or the, the classic we have is the, um, you know, we try and encourage people to turn their computers off at night, and no one does, so there's a machine that does it for them. It would take the hell out of everyone, but it, it, it saves you money, and, and you know, there's no harm in it. 
Um, putting, um, we, we found, you know, we operate rather large warehouses and you're going to have trouble keeping a store warm when you've got this great, vast expanse at the back that's just letting air out into the, into the cold winter. So we, we found it rather useful to put the uh, plastic screens in the way to divide us through. I think I go back to the store the other day and see that the guys who are coming in and out all the time got rather bored of walking into plastic so they cut them. So, <laughs> you know, it's rather good. But, okay, so we're nine tenths of the way of creating some sort of barrier. And, and, you know, double door lobbies. Um, th th this magic one, which is put more skylights in your rooms to, to allow natural lighting. It's not, it's not, um, it, you know, there's nothing new in it, but it, it illustrates the point. It starts more uh, than it grows in. And in, and in the nature of that point, this next project, we, we now just had approved the replacement of all our lighting in stores across the whole of the UK estate, which is about 360 stores, to LED. And, and that's got a, that's got a, um, a discounted payback in less than five years. So we're investing in large sums of money, and we're only able to get that capital commitment because of the measures I was just talking about previously. So if you can win the debate and start to get people to see that things do work, save money, then you'll get a big investment. Um, next lesson, uh, soften the art, cherry pick locations. So uh, when, we were, when we were assessing uh, photovoltaic, to go on the roofs of our stores. Um, <laughs> surprise, surprise, we started in the south. So I exit the store past the, uh, past the threshold, I think about three years ago, and we're edging, and we're edging slowly into colder areas in, in the UK. But, but don't make life hard for yourself, um, would be perhaps, perhaps the, uh, the thing to say. You know, prove the case for the photovoltaic where you know it's going to work, not, not don't think, oh, let's do it over the whole, the whole of the estate and therefore you change the numbers. Because it's quite a good way to get it over a third of the estate, isn't it? And then the next, uh, the next one to make is that collaborate before, before rollout. Um, so we created a network, and I'll explain what the, uh, the pictures mean in a minute, but we created a network of experts. So across the eight countries, there's a whole lot of sharing of knowledge that goes on. Um, we have a, a, a staff blog, um, it's called uh, Planet Casto in our Castorama stores, where people are chipping in ideas. This is what worked in my store, this is what worked in mine. And, and we've just launched a Facebook style app that, that is uh, connected to the whole of our proxy community. And, and that's been, it, I think one of the things we've noticed about that kind of facility is that you've got to man it regularly. You need facilitators, you need people who are enthusiastic about it, otherwise it's just it's, it's just an electronic version of the manual that's on the shelf or in the bottom drawer that no one turns to. Um, but then I suppose there's the cultural differences point. You know, if we, we don't operate in Scandinavia, but if you think that they've got 73 words for snow, it gives you an idea of, of the kind of uh, complexity you've got to deal with. So when you were talking to the Russians, it, it was a couple of years before we realised they didn't even have a word for sustainable. Um, and, and I always also find it quite difficult to have a conversation with anyone in that society about the reduction of their consumption of hydrocarbons. Um, it, it's not something that instantly grabs them. So we've just got to find different ways of having a dialogue. And then don't underestimate the snowball effect. And once things are going, they really will gain momentum. So um, in the bottom right there, we're starting a conversation now about renewables. We've got some on-site renewables in certain places, and if we've proven that business case, and people have seen that they're a good thing to do, we've now got uh, experts within some countries uh, assessing uh, off-site renewables as well. So, e external levers. Um, I, I, I hope the message here is just grab whichever works for you. So um, public statements we've talked about, setting big targets externally. Investors, the dialogue we're trying to have with them is, is one that says we're thinking ahead. We're then layering on top of that, that a, di a, a dialogue and some data around um, the increase in price around commodity purchase. 
and they see that we're actually taking steps to manage our cost base over the long term. Um, we've appointed an advisory council, so we've got some external people judging us, and we do that in a way that's very visible. We publish the report. And I'm just having an interesting conversation with our board about how I might get the advisory council to advise our board, which I think will be a, 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 will, will, will be good, uh, a good outcome. Um, who else could be helpful? So who's putting reports out that will be useful? I don't know if anyone saw Green Alliance's uh, work last week, supported by WWF, and they were there. They, they're making a call on government to put some sort of feed-in tariff in place for, um, for en energy reduction, consumption reduction. So, so there's a bit of uh, thought leadership coming out, coming out from them. Awards, well, um, we all love winning awards, but I think um, it, it's a way of uh, getting attention to senior executives that, that programs are working, they're being judged externally as relevant and leading. And then we found there's quite a lot of brand halo that we can talk to our executives around. The point being that if we're trying to sell, um, as we are, a domestic energy conservation to our customers, it's a very difficult message at the point of sale. You know, when you're buying something in a store, you've possibly got the kids dragging you away, you're, or maybe you're your partner doesn't want to be there, or you're having a tough day, or it's raining, or I don't know, or you know, what, it's, it's, it's not great, and what's the price, and uh, is it a good product? That's not where you're going to get a sustainable message across. So you need to build it into your brand message. Um, and then new commercial opportunities. This is one of the ways that we've got our board most interested in energy conservation, is by um, helping us all see that it's a big new market for, for our customers. So back to the make a business case. And then finally, I'd say, um, um, <laughs> remember uh, Hitchhiker's Hitchhiker Guide for the Galaxy, the answer has been important too, is not it? But um, we don't have all the answers, and don't wait for all the answers. And that's a great expression, you know, don't let uh, perfection get in the way of progress. So, we have a we, we're trying to create a culture in our organisation that says, have a go, you know, do it in the right way, have a go, and, and, and if it doesn't work, well, let's take a learning. Um, so that that was the point there. If I can then just summarise, there are perhaps the ten, ten sets. Go back, you're the expert, help the board understand things. Identify where you make the most impact, and then break down your journey. Set public targets and, and leave those for the protection of core business. Gain grassroots buy, and that's probably the biggest one for me in all of this. Because it's got to be happening in the reality of the story. Start small and, and build some bigger capital expenditure uh, requests from there. And, and use that success to demonstrate longer term projects. Soften the art. So um, cherry pick location. Collaborate before you roll that and remember the turmoil effect. Use it, all the external leaders that you can get hold of. And don't wait for all the answers. <coughs> Act now. So just a couple of concluding pictures. Um, you, know, you can overcome short-termism. I'm sure you are all facing short-termism in your executive teams, or you have a sense that you are. The way to do that is to set a target drive the right behaviour. And the only thing to fear is the fear of doing nothing. And then, back to our Chris. Do you think he's going to do it? I, I, I don't think he's going to do it. I don't know how to do it. Thank goodness that he overcome that inertia and that fear. Five years it took him to download the form and actually send it on. So at that point, that's the um, if there are any questions. Uh, Giles Farwell, um, AEA Energy Environment. Um, thank, thank you, Nick. That was a, that was a, sounds like a great um, case study of really how to um, embed energy performance management within a, within a business. And you know, for me, you, you, you covered a number of key points: governance, um, cap introducing KPIs, and benchmarking. Um, data, obviously, you need the data, 
and and I guess, although you probably didn't talk too much, you know, you need the grassroots buying and particularly the knowledge. People have to have the knowledge in terms of what they're going to do to change their environment and, and do things differently. So of those sort of four principles, governance, data, um, KPIs, and knowledge, what, what would you say are the sort of most, have been the most challenging for you as an organization? Lovely, it's a great question. Um, I, I think you can always have an expert buried somewhere that will be able to find you the knowledge that, that, then, that then, then build to something that says this is what our KPIs should be. I, I think the biggest challenge is collecting the data, collecting it accurately, so automation of that kind of thing is, is perhaps the solution. But then the standout is the behaviour change. Not because it's difficult and not because people don't want to do it, but just because you can't let up in your communication. It's a constant dialogue. And I, I feel that the, the, uh, the issue there is how do you keep that as a dialogue, a two-way thing, rather than just a week and a criticism, which nobody wants to come to work in that kind of environment. So it's about the quality of conversation that we have. Okay, thanks.